lot of extra stuff to work with. Whatever dropped off, whatever is in the Whatever is in If you've got a ton of stamps, it's not. So that's the thing. It's in the middle. Yeah. See, he's keeping it as a punch. No. Yeah. Are we supposed to shut this? Jason, you, I really thought you were supposed to speak up. You were trying to say something. No. Shut up. That's not my uh, uh, position. Yes. I don't have to do that. <laughs> This is Darcy and Amy, and they're going to be talking to us about the current tax issues for people involved in agriculture and stuff. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> I'm Darcy Riem, and I'm a CPA up in Haver, Montana, for about 40 miles south of the Canadian border, and I'm involved in Farm and Ranch also. My job in town, I guess, is a CPA, and we're part of a family operation, and so this is Amy Iverson. She's at our Billings office, and she's a Wyoming native. <laughs> I'm from Thermopolis, Wyoming. I grew up on a ranch about 30 miles out of Thermopolis. Um, and then moved to the big city to go to the school, and ended up getting married and stayed there. So now I'm from Billings. Yeah. And we're going to go through some different issues of some things going on in agriculture, but there's a lot of information that we can talk about, and so we want to kind of gloss over a lot of things fairly quickly that aren't going to impact you, but if you guys don't mind, just kind of going around and giving us a little bit of idea of who you are and what type of involvement you have with agriculture and what things you have going on, that'll help us to know which things to spend a little bit more time on. And maybe a tidbit of why you're here. <laughs> If you want. <laughs> I'm Heather Perry. I'm from Boulder, Wyoming, and I grew up on a ranch down there. And I'm just here as a student majoring in ag production. I'm Cameron Perry. I'm from Star Valley, Wyoming, and I'm here going for production agriculture. And I grew up on a ranch. I'm Tasha Gore. I'm from Jerome, Idaho. I'm here for ag ed. Um, I'm Ashley Hartman. I'm from Denton, Montana. I grew up on a ranch there, and I'm here for animal science. I'm Jim Elbury. I live here in Powell. I grew up on a ranch, and so I retired. So I need to know what the tax issues are now. I'm Tara Beely. I'm originally from Big Timber, Montana. I live in Billings now. Um, I work for the USDA Risk Management Agency. We provide funding for this meeting through one of our education and grant programs. And I also grew up on a ranch, and we also run a few cows um, in our Billings. John Lockie, I also work for USDA RMA, um, and then I'm from Eastern Montana originally. Uh, we still have a, a few cows and put up some hay and stuff, and so we're trying to get bigger. So as long as I'm here, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. I'm Jason Horton. I'm an instructor of agribusiness here at Northwest College, and I grew up in Mississippi on row crop farming and a grain elevator. And I'm Kay Newley. <laughs> and I invite people to the <laughs> well, thanks. And we're really informal. You guys feel free to jump in and ask questions at any point. Stop us and tell us if you don't know what we're talking about and you want us to explain it a little bit different or anything, too. We're going to go over, and we call it tax management, here, and that's fairly broad and not about different things, what you can get from your CPA and how you can better have your CPA help you manage your individual issues along with some different provisions available in the tax code. Then we're going to go in and will talk to you about the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012. That's the latest tax bill that they passed on New Year's Day. And then a few things on what's coming next from other tax code things that were in place before that bill that are still <coughs> continuing to phase in over time. Um, to start with, you know, things your CPA can do, obviously, prepare your tax return and just keep you in compliance and out of trouble with the IRS. can help you with your bookkeeping and developing your bookkeeping systems and using that to your advantage. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about payroll, some requirements that you need to be aware of, and some alternative ways that you might provide incentives for employees other than just traditional payroll. And some tax planning things, and then using your CPA as a trusted business advisor and what you can do to help get the most from that relationship with your accountant. Sorry, it was bugging me. Yeah, I don't know how to get rid of it from <laughs> trying for a semester now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll move it up here. You have to click over now to the. Oh. There you All go. right. <laughs> Okay, so to start with, when you bring your stuff in, I mean, everybody puts their stuff together and file their tax return, even if it's simple now, you still, if you have any sort of job or income that you need to file a tax return, you put your stuff into it, and I'm sure you all think, well, you just write your numbers down on a piece of paper and account and just write them down on the forms, right? Well, there's a lot of decisions that go into it. Obviously, the more complex the return, the more decisions that go into filing that return. Um, everything from when you write down livestock sales, you know, we have questions like, was it breeding livestock versus calves that would be inventory on a farm operation? And then if it's breeding livestock, was it raised versus purchased? Is it over two years old or under two years old? All of those different categories of livestock have different treatment and different rates that they're taxed at for that income. So those questions determine how much tax you pay on those different kinds of income. So it's like, I just wrote down livestock sales. Those are some of the different decisions that go into getting it onto the tax return forms. And we always like to ask, what are your goals? And you, that probably sounds funny when you think about preparing a tax return. But especially for those of you that are involved in production agriculture, there's a lot of decisions that can go into making a tax return look in a lot of different ways, from showing a profit to a loss completely just based off of elections you make on the tax return. And obviously, the first goal that people say when you ask them is, I don't want to pay any taxes. But there's a lot more that you need to think of to think ahead for the future when you're thinking about paying taxes or not. If you consistently just keep your tax return in a loss year after year, eventually it's going to catch up to you because taxes is pretty much all about timing. And if you're paying down debt, if you're developing capital to be able to expand or to buy land or make other purchases, at some point you're going to have to pay tax on that money to ever be able to get into a position of having something you can retire off of or get out down the road. So the further ahead you can think and plan, and we'll show you some examples of how you can balance your taxable income over time and minimize the tax impact, will get you a lot farther ahead than just not paying any tax, because that's going to build up and then you're going to pay tax at a higher rate when it catches up to you. And that kind of goes into your tax management strategy. And really the best advice on that is to, like I say, always kind of be thinking ahead and utilizing your tax brackets as they come. And then the provisions in the tax code, and we'll get into some more detail on this, but there's different elections you can make that can really drive your taxable income, whether it be depreciation op options, deferral of income, prepaying expenses. There's a lot of different things that you can just do for timing or on the tax return that can determine where you're at. We talk about bookkeeping and I'm sure, especially for you guys that are here, you're going to school, a lot of you are probably going to go back to a family operation and eventually be the ones that get handed the books. Here, your problem now, I don't want the headache anymore. And it's really important to try to think ahead. A lot of people still do the manual ledgers and there's nothing wrong with that. Just, you know, but you need to keep track of your business versus your personal expenses. And in agriculture, that's lines that can be really tough to keep track of because you're out there, you're running the place and everything's one, so to speak. And depending on what type of structure you have, there might not be a lot of personal expenses. I mean, traditionally people in agriculture kind of your life and you don't do a lot of other things. Everything ends up being somehow related to the business. And, but you want to keep those lines clean, especially if you're in an entity structure. There's pretty common in agriculture now for to be a corporate farm. And 
to keep the personal versus corporate expenses distinguished is really critical as you go forward. Um, your accountant can help you with using QuickBooks as one of the most common software things that we see. It's easy to use, it's fairly inexpensive to get into, and it's pretty widely used. I know we have a lot of clients use QuickBooks and they can bring it into us. Every CPA in our office has multiple versions of QuickBooks on our computers, so we can just plug in, they can do an accounts review, we can make changes, give it back to them, they can import those changes onto their computer so that any mistakes they made during the year or anything, adjustments that need to be made for the tax return are in their books, which really helps them get a picture of where they're at during the year. Because you see a lot of people, we see a lot of people right now, especially that the young farmers that are going, Northwest Farm Credit, I know, has seminars for their beginning farmers that they really promote this. The FSA has beginning farmer programs and stuff where they really push young people to know where you're at all the time, not just at the end of the year when it comes to time to pay taxes and you're trying to determine how much tax you're going to owe, but actually throughout the year to know are the decisions you're making turning a problem. And then your record management, keeping your receipts and your support for that tax return and, and all of the documentation to go along with it. How long do you need to keep it for? Most people don't realize you really should keep your tax returns forever because those tax returns and the information on those tax returns actually can determine part of the basis for your estate after you die. So your heirs will be looking back at those tax returns over the course of your lifetime at times to determine if there's an estate tax issue or not. As far as all of the receipts and that seven years is generally the rule of thumb for anything that's deducted on the tax return. There's more details on that. That's a good rule of thumb. For people that have employees in that there's payroll requirements. We're right in the midst of January, which is payroll season for most people. Um, W-2s and 1099s are required to be filed by January 31st to the recipients. So that's going on right now. Um, and then a 1099 is a form that you pay to an independent contractor versus a W-2 is for an employee. And then we'll talk about different other ways you can pay employees other than just cash wages. Um, 1099s are required for anybody that you pay. Basically, if you're deducting it, on, as far as in agriculture, if you're deducting an expense for a service and it's over $600 to any individual in that year, you, you should be issuing them a 1099 as far as, and that, the, a lot of people will be like, oh, they're just a business in town. Well, a lot of businesses in town, like the local repair shop or something that you take your vehicle in to get repaired, if they're not incorporated, you do need to send them a 1099. I was really impressed right off the bat when we got here. They had the W-9 forms out and had all the speakers filling out the W-9 forms for, to send 1099s to them. And that, but it's something that's overlooked, but there are penalties associated with not filing 1099s. And so if you know that right off the bat, that'll save you from getting in trouble on that. Freight, which trucking for cattle, livestock and grain and, and any commodities is considered freight, you don't need to issue 1099s to truckers. That's just a little provision that they got in there. That's one of the most common things I'd say that we get confusion on. And lawyers, even if they are a corporation, you have to send a 1099 to lawyers because they cheat too much. <laughs> so the IRS doesn't like them too much? No. <laughs> what if you get one late? If you get one late? Yeah, if you got one from somebody, and, but it came in after the end of January. Like the middle of March, you yeah. 1099 shows up? Well, it depends on how much you like the person that sent it or not. Mm -hmm. You can turn them in. They could be subject to late filing penalties. Um, Did you include it in your income? I had. Luckily. Okay. Then and you're, you're okay. I kind of wanted to strangle them. Like I say, you can turn them in and they could be subject to late filing penalties on that. Um, they would get a $50 hit for each 1099 they sent out late is what would happen if you got it in the middle of March. Um, 
they're not actually required to be filed with the IRS until the end of February. So they're not yet late with their filing to the IRS if they sent it like at the end of February and if they're e-filing them even to the end of March on that. So they're probably not, the IRS doesn't even realize they sent it to you late yet at that point. So they would only rely on you turning them in to get in trouble. So you say to an attorney, are you, I mean, you accumulate all your expenses throughout the year and do it the same as you would an independent contractor? Yeah, if, it, if you've paid an attorney over $600 during the year for business expenses, not for like personal non-deductible attorney fees, but for business expenses, you should be sending them a 1099. So is, is there a red flag that goes up to IRS if you've deducted that as attorney fees on your um, your tax? There can be. It's not an area that we're seeing the IRS getting really active in right now, going after people for not sending 1099s. I think they don't really have the manpower at the moment. But if you got audited on anything else, and a lot of times it's actually um, a workers' comp audit that trips the flag for 1099s not being filed, it's the most common thing that we see, the penalties can get assessed at that point. But and it's 50 per, doesn't matter what the amount is? Yeah, that's the initial, but then depending on how long it's been that you haven't filed it, that can grow. So. Okay. And then there's additional file, there's additional penalties for not, not giving it to the recipient, but then there's also penalties for not sending it to the IRS. The penalties can rack up quite a bit. They actually upped those penalties as part of the health care reform because obviously that's related. So. <laughs> sure, it's all money. <laughs> <laughs> to distinguish too between who gets a 1099 and who really should be an employee and get a W-2. That's something that we see very commonly misunderstood. Um, on independent contractors, there's federal laws of who's an employee versus an independent contractor and there's state laws and every state has their own laws. Um, whichever is the strictest is what rules. They, they always err on the side of the strictest laws, whether it be federal or state in determining that I'm very familiar with Montana laws, and I looked a little bit to get familiar with Wyoming laws, and they didn't look a lot different, so I think we're okay on talking about. The main thing is whoever exercises control, who says when you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, it, who's providing the tools necessary to do the job, um, you know, does that person provide that same service to other people or only for the person that's hiring them. Those are some of the questions that come into play to determine if somebody should be an independent contractor versus an employee. We see it like you hire somebody to break colts, something. Now, if that person's in the business of breaking colts and they break a lot of different people's colts and ride horses for people and do have their business, they can probably be an independent contractor. But if you're somebody that's you know, raising horses and you have a lot of them and that person is your person that breaks colts and you tell them which horse they're going to ride first and they're only breaking your colts and you're kind of directing how they're going to do it and, and when they're going to do it, they probably should be an employee. Um, you see it with fencing is another thing. We see a lot of in agriculture on those things. Um, might be harvest help. So if they're not doing it for anybody else and they're using your tools and doing it your way in your time frame, you really need to consider if they should be an employee and subject to payroll taxes and withholding and potentially workers' comp. So w when you mentioned trucking, uh, I mean, you say uh, it's at their time frame and whatnot. I mean, very seldom when you hire a truck that it would be at their time frame to deliver your product. Are they driving your truck or is it their truck is usually the determining factor. On so the that's truck. the determining factor. What if Not always, but that's the most common issue that comes up in, on truckers. Okay. So if you lease the vehicle to them, can you circumvent that? Or is, do they get really technical? You're going to get really into a facts and circumstances and you better have all of your facts in place. You better have a, a contract with them. I mean, when you're getting to that, you're going to want a written contract, not just a verbal agreement saying those things. You're going to want to be, if you're leasing it from, to them, 
they're going to be sending you a 1099 for lease because you, you need to be a, doing a 1099 for rent as well. Um, you want all of the facts and circumstances. When you get into that gray area, you can make it work, but you need to do it right. And then some different ways to pay employees that can, I mean, you see it a lot, a lot of times why people are looking for people to be independent contractors is they don't want to pay the Social Security and the Medicare and all that withholding tax on those employees and have that additional tax. So these are some different options of how you can pay employees and minimize the tax impact. The most common way to pay employees is just cash. Wages, you withhold, you know, it's reported on a W-2. When I say cash, I Check is commonly referred to as cash. <laughs> um, one that brings up a point. A lot of people think if you actually deal in cash, it's not taxable, which is not true. Um, from the IRS's standpoint, if they can construct it, they will tax it and they won't allow deductions against it if you don't report it because it's cash and they can construct it in an audit that you've been doing a cash business. So that's something to be aware of because it's very commonly misconstrued that, oh, I just paid them in cash, so I'll have to report that. What's the threshold kind of, of, of like $120 or something that you have to file? And then, uh, 600. 600. Yeah. For an employee? 600 is for everything except for interest. Interest is $10 if you paid somebody. So you could pay somebody five hundred dollars cash and not and still show it as a deduction? The, no. no, that's to file a ten ninety nine. That doesn't what it is is if you pay somebody five hundred dollars, they're still supposed to claim it as income. Whether you give them a ten ninety nine or not. You can claim it as a deduction as long as it, you have documentation to support your deduction. You a receipt paid or a check. You gave them a check. Or you or you can pay them in cash. That doesn't matter. From your standpoint of deducting it, you need to have a receipt and support for the deduction. But they need to claim it as income, even if they didn't get a 1099 and it wasn't cash. Because we have a lot of times part-time that's supposed to be mm -hmm. um, Then we we'll, we'll try to find out what their address is. It yeah. seems to be, and a lot of times they're not. So if they're under 600, we can just show them that's a, that we pay it out. Yeah. Like said, as long as you have, you know, the proper support to show your your deduction. So, and then we we don't have the 1099. Or if they're under 600, you don't have to do the 1099. Now that does not that 600 is for a 1099. That doesn't trump if they should be an employee. They still have to meet the criteria of being an independent contractor versus an employee. If if you hire somebody that that meets the definition of an employee, you need to send them a W-2 if they earn one dollar. Oh, yeah. okay. so. There's no minimum threshold on getting a W-2. Right. Um, In-kind wages is something I don't know if any of you are <coughs> familiar with this. Um, when you pay in-kind wages, which is basically you can pay an employee in grain, calves, whatever commodity you're in the business of producing, and when you do in-kind wages, as long as you do it right, and there's a set criteria, the employee has to bear the risk of loss is essentially what it is. So you have to transfer it to them and they hold it for some period of time. We usually like to do a rule of thumb of 30 days minimum that the employee owns that, like the cabs or whatever. They pay the feed expense, they pay storage if it's grain. They mark it independently. Now they can go all together if that's the best marketing decision, but the employee should reimburse for trucking or any cost associated with, with marketing the commodity. <coughs> but in-kind wages do not have to be Social Security or Medicare taxes paid on them. That's the big advantage of doing in-kind wages is you can avoid those payroll taxes. <coughs> so that's something, um, especially for younger people, a lot of times with a cow-calf operation, you'll see them pay the kids that are working on the place in calves, help the, the kids build their own livestock herd, and in the meantime, it's it's a deduction for the parents. It's it's income taxed, but it's not subject to self-employment tax for the kids. And usually, if you're in a low tax bracket, there might not even be a tax 
do on that, depending on how much they do. Um, but the parents are getting the deductions, there's not the payroll taxes. So you're not getting that extra 15.3% worth of payroll taxes on that. What about the people that, they, it used to be common in Montana, that they would, you work for us, we give you a place to live, we give you the, we. Yeah, and that's when we get into the housing and the board and some of those other ways of compensating for people. Um, health insurance is pretty standard for a benefit that can be paid pre-tax by an employer. Um, medical reimbursement plans, we most commonly see this with the family-owned corporate farms that will, the corporation will provide a medical reimbursement plan and basically you set a limit on that, you do the documentation and then the corporation can pay the medical expenses of the employees pre-tax. So that can be a real advantage of being able to deduct those medical expenses at the corporate level. Really. Disability insurance, we're seeing more commonly that people are looking into disability insurance. Um, usually if you have something that you're holding on to and not going to get a gift or get rid of in your lifetime and you're concerned about long-term care costs, you'll want to provide some, some long-term care or some disability insurance to, to offset that because the Medicaid rules have a five-year look back on getting rid of things at the point when you go into the nursing home, so you'll need some sort of insurance so that the whole place doesn't end up going to pay for nursing home costs because they're just outrageous anymore. So if, if you're in an LLC and you're the sole manager of the LLC, do, do they look at that as your asset? Who, when you say that? When you're talking Medicare. Medicaid? Or, or I guess dis yes. disability, for lack of less for, for Medicaid purposes, they would look at all of that as the LLC as yours. So the LLC truly isn't a shed of asset then? No. Hmm. No, not a single member LLC. Because you have ownership in it, whatever your ownership is in the LLC. Also on the disability insurance, if you do get pre-tax, benefits are taxable. Yes. Whereas most disability policies are paid with after-tax dollars and benefits are taxable. That yeah. that's surprises people sometimes. Yeah. In disability insurance, typically the whole benefit is not able to be pre-tax. There's a formula and there's limits that go through. And then the it's calculated on a pro rata basis of what's taxable based off of the benefit you got from deducting the premiums. The income tax problem on paying for the disability benefits that you receive usually isn't the hard factor at that point, it's just flat getting the, the nursing home costs paid for when you're in that phase. Uh, most disability plans don't cover 100% of your nursing home costs. It, the premiums on a plan that would cover 100% are too outrageous for most people to afford. The reality is you want to have enough coverage to be able to float till you could get things in place and taken care of for Medicaid purposes is the most common planning we're seeing these days. And most disability plans will end at age 65, whereas the long-term care goes on beyond that age. Um, meals is something that you can provide to employees and not have to report on their W-2 or consider as a benefit for tax purposes, and you can deduct the cost of, of providing those meals. That can include groceries if you have somebody that is there to convert those groceries into meals. You can't just provide employees meals. So what we typically do is we write an employment agreement and we say the spouse typically, or it could be either one, but we write right in the employment agreement part of their duties as the employee is to prepare meals so that that creates the groceries to be deductible in that setting. That's only available like in a family, farm, or ranch situation. You have to be a C corporation to be able to do that for the owner employee. In a sole proprietorship or a partnership type structure, the owners are not considered employees for the purposes of deducting meals. So, uh, for instance, uh, I'm only allowed to deduct, or at least the way I've been told is to deduct 50% of the meals. Now that would be business meals off the place. That's like when you go on a business trip and you go in and those are 50% deductible. You're, you would put the whole amount on and then through the tax return it, it cuts them in half 
how much you have to get okay. to benefit. But to buy groceries and feed a crew should be 100%. Yeah, yeah. If you if you have hired hands that are there and, and they're the the rule from the IRS standpoint is that they need to be required to be there for the convenience of the employer, which is usually pretty easy to meet in agriculture. Yeah. You're you don't have a McDonald's next door that can run over and get lunch at. You know, so. That generally will meet the threshold for the convenience of the employer. It's easier to have everybody eat on site in those meals than for any, like I say, employees, not the sole proprietor. You know, mom and pop are out running the farm. They don't get to eat all their meals. But and I'm pretty close to town. A lot of times we'll just load everyone up and take them to town. If you did such, that's 100% as well. No, you took them to town. It's 50%. Okay. It's no longer required to be on site for the convenience of the employer. Okay. <coughs> housing and board, this is where you see the hired hands in their provided housing. Typically for payroll tax rules, on as long as they're required to again to, to live there for the convenience of the employer, you don't have to include that in their W two wages. There needs to be a business purpose of why the employer, whether it be in that the, a corporation or a sole proprietor, is requiring them to live there. Whether it be, you know, to nightcap would qualify for that. If you're watching over, you know, if you have a problem, it seems like we've seen a lot of farmers that have the chemicals. I, I don't know enough about drugs to really understand it, but apparently some of the chemicals that you use spraying for weeds and stuff can be used to make Meth or someone. Like I said, I don't know that much about the whole drug scene, but there's something they're stealing for the drug wow. trafficking thing. So that creates a reason to have an employee there watching over your chemical storage and, and things of that nature as well. Um, then you don't need to include it. Otherwise, you would need to include a provision into the W 2 to compensate for the housing allowance that you're providing. Vehicle usage is, again, kind of the same rules. Retirement plans are fairly straightforward. But you can get all sorts of different types of them. No additional cost benefits. This is, yeah, pasture that you're not using, and you maybe let an employee run a few head of cattle on there. It doesn't cost you anything else. You don't have to include that in their wages. And minimis fringe benefits are the things that are kind of too small to worry about. Sometimes the personal use of the cell phone, if there's a business use of the cell phone, the, the plan costs the same whether they use it for some personal use to or not. You can include that as a minimus benefit. Just things to, to keep in mind is a lot of different things have to be offered pro rata to all of your employees, not just for the owners. So if you have additional employees, it, to the owners, you have to consider if you want to give those same benefits across the board. One way that you can get around that is groups of employees. You can say, you know, you have to be over a certain age, you have to be employed for a certain number of years, work a certain number of hours, any of those <coughs> things, but you can't discriminate and say you have to be an owner. Um, talking a little bit about tax planning, I'm going to try to speed up because I don't want to use up all the time because we have the new tax law to talk about too. But um, some of the main things is to manage the tax brackets and try to spread out tax brackets. There's the 15% bracket, and that ends at like 72.5. And so that means you have your 10%, your 15% bracket, your 25%. They go graduated, which means like the first. X dollars, I think Amy has some exact numbers, I don't have them in the top of my head, um, is taxed at 10%. And that's always taxed at 10%. Then it's not like if you get up to $50,000, the whole thing is taxed at 15%. You still have the first, like 15,000 at 10%, and then the difference <coughs> is what's taxed at 15%. A lot of people don't understand how the graduated tax brackets work. If you kick into the 25% bracket, it doesn't take everything taxed at 25%, just the amount over into that bracket. Um, we'll show you some examples on spreading profits, talk a little bit about entity structure, and then some specific things in the tax code. 
ultimately when you go into tax planning, the question really is how much do you want to pay and when do you want to pay it? Because like I say, everything about taxes is pretty much time. There's a skip. <laughs> Here, we talked about it. Okay. Um, this is just an example in a corporate setting. On corporations, the first 50000 is taxed at 10%. The following 25000 to 75000 is at 25%. And then you get up into the 33% corporate tax bracket. So this is just an example. If you have 100000 in profit over two years, if the first year you had 25000 and the second year you had 75000 your total tax is 17500 where if you spread that evenly, and we'll show you some different options how you can even that out, your total tax over the two years would be 15000 So just through the use of some different elections and some planning and management structure, you can save 2500 in tax, and you still made 100000 those years, but ultimately you have more money in your pocket. On an individual, the so Schedule F type farmer, um, we just threw out some different facts because there's a lot of different things that go into it. So in a very simple form, they're married, filing joint, Spouse makes 20000 in town. The farmer ranch makes 150000 over two years. If the farm profit is split, so year one has 10000 year two has 140000 maybe you deferred cap sales into the second year, the total tax for both years is $44,668. If the farm profit is split, so it's even over the two years, 75000 75000 Pulled that cap income back into the first year and, and even things out, your total tax is 39400 The tax is saved just by utilizing the, and maximizing your tax brackets instead of leaving all your low brackets unused in the first year and piling it into the higher brackets the second year is $5,268 over those two years. And to see it even on what we see a lot of times, the Approximately the same, you know, spouse makes 20000 in town, the farm makes 60000 over two years. But year one, you have $20,000 loss. Year two, you have an $80,000 profit. You, you just drove it into the loss. You didn't think ahead. Maybe you had a crop failure and you didn't get the crop insurance until the next year or something in, in there. Your total tax over the two years is almost 21000 if you just could bring that loss up to even and not have that loss at all, and you had all the 60000 in year two, it's at fourteen three, And then if you could really even them out, so it's 30000 each, it's fourteen one. And the reason that these aren't as much different as this one is because your personal exemption, your standard deduction, your child tax credits, if you have them, you know, depending on how many kids you have, it comes into there. The personal exemption and the standard deduction are use it or lose it. You don't get to carry those into the next year. So even just, you know, not completely wasting them, you can save some more tax that way. And that's not taking the self-employed tax. What's that? That doesn't have the self-employed tax built into that, correct? Yes. So that, that does have self-employed Yeah, tax. on the farm profits okay. it does. And then just some different little provisions that you can keep in mind, and Amy will talk about how the new tax law affected a lot of these. I'm sure you guys hear a lot about Section 179, and I'm sure that for a lot of you that goes over your head because you have no idea what that means. That's the tax code that actually refers to capital purchases, equipment, breeding livestock are considered capital equipment, you know, capital purchases. Um, the, typically would have to be depreciated out over the estimated useful life, which the IRS determines based off of what types of things, like breeding livestock is five years, where, you know, most general equipment is seven years for farm and ranch. Um, then with Section 179, you can go and you can buy the new truck or whatever and take it all in the first year that you bought it. That's when you hear of people going and, you know, doing things at the end of the year to say taxes that are usually used in Section 179. Section 179 is limited to active business 
income. So if you're in a farm rental situation where you're leasing out the land to somebody else, Section 179 is not available to you. And a lot of people forget about that and they go and they're worried about taxes, they go and buy something, and then they're disappointed because it only helped them a sliver versus getting all of that deduction that year. Bonus depreciation is available for rentals, but it has to be on brand new assets. And that means original use with the taxpayer. And it's kind of funny because it gets into the IRS determining what's a brand new cow, what's a brand new bull, you know. And <laughs> they have regulations out. It needs to be a first calf heifer or a virgin bull to qualify for bonus depreciation. Don't ask me about chickens, I've had that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, capital gains and dividends are taxed at lower rates than ordinary income, and capital gains are typically when you sell land or equipment within the business for more than you, your basis, which land is usually the basis of what you paid for it, equipment would be what you paid for it less the depreciation you've taken on it. So if you take once at 79 on the whole thing when you bought it, your basis is zero, so the whole amount that you sell it for is going to be depreciation recapture and then capital gains. But you hear a lot about capital gains, and people think of them as a bad thing, because they usually hit a lot, but they're actually a lower tax rate than ordinary income. That's something that a lot of people don't understand. And then there's different tax credits and deductions that can help you available. A lot of you are college students. <coughs> Question's probably coming up. Should you claim yourselves, or should your parents claim you? And you probably have tax credits going along with your tuition. And whoever's in the highest tax bracket is probably who should claim you because the credit for your tuition, which can be up to $2,000 right now with the American Opportunity Credit, depending on how much you're paying in tuition after scholarships and that, um, can go into it. So tell your parents, you can claim me and then you can pay me the difference you get for the tax credit. <laughs> <laughs> Under the table. <laughs> That's a gift. <laughs> um, the domestic production activities deduction, this is one provision in the tax code that's kind of fun because it's not just a timing thing, it's not going to catch you later. It's actually a deduction that as a result of different trade tariff things, they implemented this, but um, raising livestock and grains that qualify for it. The limiting factors is it's 9% of your domestic gross production income but it's subject to one half of your wages reported on W-2 wages and your taxable income. It can't take it down below zero. So those are usually the limiting factors that we see on how much of a benefit you can get for that. We do. It is a benefit we see people taking. The earned income credit, if you're in a low tax bracket and you have earned income, you might be able to get a refundable credit. That actually can be in excess of what you've paid in, which is kind of unique to that tax credit. And then just another thing to keep in mind, sometimes we choose to do things on tax returns because the tax returns get used for a lot of other purposes. FAFSA is one of them, the financial aid forms. And you might want to elect some of your depreciation options and timing things, even if it's not the best move to totally even out your taxable income over time, it might pay off more so by the FAFSA benefits that are available. There's also considerations on loans. Sometimes you want to elect to have income because you need to show that to your loan officer in order to get the, the capital you need to, to make the improvements, things that you need as well. So, so just to say sometimes it's not all about just the bottom line on the tax, it's why you do things on your tax return. Um, Income deferral and expense timing, you talked a little bit, I'm sure you guys are aware. You can defer income into the next year um, through things. You can do deferred contracts. You can use an intermediary and actually do a sophisticated deferral on grain income or cattle sales and have it deposited with a third party if you don't want to just have somebody not pay you until then. One thing that's really important is you have to do it right. If somebody gives you the check and you say, oh no, I want this next year, take it back, you have constructive receipt of that income and the IRS would pull it into that year. You can never have that in your possession.
question. And we see that with the grain elevator. You, you told them not to give you the check till after the first year, but they wrote it to you anyways. And what one of the court cases that's pretty famous on this is that happened, the elevator wrote them the check. They said, no, pay me next year. I told you to pay me next year. They didn't go through a third party intermediary. They didn't have a bond on that or anything. They tore up the check. The elevator went out of business. They didn't get their money on audit. The IRS pulled the money and they had to pay the tax on it and never got their money. Wow. So you have to make sure you do it right if you're going to do income deferrals. Um, depreciation options, we talked about. And the fun thing about Section 179 is you don't have to decide till it's time to do the tax return how much you want to expense in that year or not. So you can buy the equipment and decide if you're going to take it over time or all in one year. We talked about the employee compensation options, retirement plans. You can contribute to IRAs and certain other types of retirement plans all the way up to the due date of the return as well. And retirement plans can go everything from a pretty simple IRA to a fairly complex profit sharing plan and everything in between on that. Um, your business structure, this requires a forethought, but depending on what type of business structure you're in, you can gain additional tax brackets or lower tax brackets or different benefits based off of structuring your business in the right type of entity. Charitable planning and contributions, that's always important to consider. Um, you know, one thing is timing on charitable deductions because we all like to be charitable, but most people do want the tax benefit from it as well. And sometimes it's almost good to alternate from year to year, do a lot of charitable deductions, one, charitable contributions one year, not as many the next year. And then there's also um, different planned giving options and, and things, incentives on that to help contribute to certain endowments and things of that nature. And then proactive planning. The earlier you think about it, the more options you have available to you. If you're waiting until it's time to do the tax return, you're really limited on how much you can do to control what your taxable income is going to be on that return. Some things with income deferrals. You can defer grain and cattle sales. Crop insurance is just an election you can make on the tax return to defer crop insurance into the next year if you tr typically would have sold that crop in the next year. Um, CCC loans you can elect to treat as either a loan or as income on your tax return. And then you guys have been in some drought situations around here and I'm sure you have people that have been selling livestock due to the drought. The gains on those livestock sales, there's several different provisions that can be done to defer the, grain, the gain or replace instead of paying the tax on the gain when you're in drought stri stricken areas or having to sell livestock for weather related conditions as long as it's a federally declared disaster area and then depending on if it's presidentially declared versus just a federal declared there's more options available to you on the replacement period of time you have five years if it's presidentially declared to replace so if you sold all cows last year due to the drought you can go through this not pay the taxes on it as long as you replace them within the time limit, then yeah. you never pay taxes on it yeah and if it's just federally declared and it's not presidentially declared that distinction, you have to replace them with like assets. So if it's breeding cattle, you have to replace them with breeding cattle, not bulls, but cattle. Right. You can't just rebuild from your own herd, keeping replacements. But if it's presidentially declared, then you actually can rebuild your herd from your own numbers, and you can even replace with, say, a tractor or something else you need on the place. How long do you have if it's federally declared? Five years. Both well, it depends. Years. It depends on the election. I should be careful on saying that. There's, there's three different types of elections on drought-stricken livestock sales. There's what they call 451, and then there's 1031E, and then there's two different options within the 1031E. So if you're in that position, I really recommend you go and you, you sit down and you talk to your accountant about your specific details of your, of your situation because it's going to be fairly personal, exactly what makes sense. So in Montana and Wyoming, was it presidentially declared or not? Areas were. Okay. Um, it, it lists certain counties that, that were. Actually, where we are, we're... Tabber's fine. We're fine this year. I yeah. almost hate to say that in this crowd, but yeah. we're far enough north that we're above the drought, and we're usually not where you look to for the best weather, but this year we actually were. So 
question on this deferral, if you're in a partnership, do, do both partners have to file the same way? Or can one file for an extension and the other will pay the tax? And, the election has to be made at the partnership level, wherever the livestock are owned. And that would be at the partnership level, typically. Okay. Is there a, an age requirement on those livestock, say heifer calves versus aged cows? It would, it would have to be breeding livestock, so they'd have to be at least two. The heifer calves a potential breeding livestock. You're going to have to get into a facts and circumstances. You wouldn't meet the rule of thumb. Okay. I mean, if, you're, if you sold off your replacements, Due to it, you're really going to have to show you're in that where you typically would have kept these numbers, sure. and you you're going to have to have a history to support that, and then you can again. When you get into these things, every situation is pretty unique. You really want to sit down with somebody with your situation and go over it because you usually need a three-year history to support what you're deferring as well. And do you find? I mean. Surely an IRS agent isn't going to know that for cows versus old cows. Is there anything that red flags a circumstance like that? Well, when you're showing your history, your heifer calves would, would typically be what's going into your breeding, and then they would be able to deduct that based off of what your traditional calf sales were. And they would expect those to decline over the future years. If you're, if so, um, I'm a nerd, so I've read the IRS audit guide on things. I like to know what they know. Um, <laughs> We like nerds at tax so. <laughs> <laughs> Because they don't they don't know. I mean they couldn't go out in the field and tell you anything. But they have formulas in their audit guide that tell them how they can determine that. So, but really, like I say, you're gonna want to sit down, go over your specific situation and talk about this. I don't know if you guys back in the early two thousands in that we had six years of drought up in our area, we did a lot of Um, expense timing, this is kind of the traditional tax planning, you know, buying things before the end of the year. The main thing to realize is you can prepay on things like feed and fuel, but you can only prepay what you would use within one year's time. And when you prepay, you need to lock in the quantity and the type. You can't just go up to the co-op and say, oh, I'm sure well, I'll have 20000 worth of expenses here, I'm going to prepay it. If you're doing fuel, fertilizer, whatever you're doing, you have to say X amount of this for future delivery. You can't just go and put it on account and have it hold up in an audit on a pre-purchase. And you have to have an in-hand contract to specify that? It doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, I'm not talking about making an appointment with a lawyer to write up a contract. If you have a receipt from the co-op that says you pre-purchased fuel for future delivery, you know, 1,000 gallons of number two diesel or whatever you're, you're doing, that's sufficient. But you need to have some written documentation to support, like I say, type of, you know, quantity, price, and, and type of what you're, you're buying. And it does need to be, you're locking in the price and the quantity at that time. As far as using your CPA as a trusted business advisor, and a lot of things, we get into a lot of different entity structures in agriculture these days. Um, the sole proprietor is just kind of the traditional, you're running it, reporting it on your schedule F, you have one tax return each year for the, the operation and your individual return. The partnership involves two people. We're seeing a lot more like husband and wife's filing as partnerships for various purposes, which is kind of interesting. So when they're filing separately, married filing separately? No, nope, they're still filing a joint individual return, but the, they're running the, the operation as a partnership and taking advantage of some of the provisions that a partnership will allow for. Um, some of the FSA rules sometimes can get into determining how people want to operate as well. Um, we see that with a C corporation. It's getting, depending on what the farm bill is going to be, I guess we don't know, but you'll see different entity structures with different owners to get different FSA limits. And I don't know if you guys see that as much. We're up in, like I say, the golden triangle of growing wheat. We see a lot of that up there. Um, 
an S corporation is it files a corporate return, but the income tax get, flows through and gets paid at the individual level. A C corporation, the income tax actually gets paid by the corporation itself. It's important to realize one of the bigger things between a C corporation and an S corporation in agriculture is some of the employee incentives. For the employee owners, there's some of those are deductible on a C corporation and not at an S corporation, such as employee housing for the employee owners is one of the biggest things that we see in having that house be a corporate expense. And that it, it's cracked down and yeah, it's a lot more difficult to have that stand up in an S corporation environment than a C corporation. What about <coughs> getting out of an S corporation compared to a C corporation? Getting out of it, typically there's a lot more costs associated with getting out of a C corporation than an S corporation. Um, there's costs associated with either, but a C corporation, there's the double taxation that you hear about at times. Everything that comes out of that corporation, so at the point when you're going to get out and you have the land, the livestock, everything in that corporation, the corporation can either sell the assets or you can sell the corporate stock but ultimately, when you want the money in your pocket and not, not the corporation anymore, it has to come out of the corporation as something. Typically, a dividend at the point when you're getting out, which is not a deduction to the corporation, is income to the shareholder. The corporation already had to pay tax on all the gain of selling the assets. On either one? No, on a C corporation. On an S corporation, when you take the dividend out, it's, it's not subject to double taxation because there's only one tax return. That's one of the biggest drawbacks of a C corporation versus an S corporation. Your accountant can help with estate and business transitions, and we'll talk more about that in the session tomorrow, so I'm just going to skim over that now. And then what's really important is to realize you have a lot of different advisors when you're in agriculture. You got your banker, you got your lawyer, you got your accountant, you got all of these different advisors. And some of the most effective meetings when you're talking really about doing something major, get them all in the same room and just sit them down and pound through it all because otherwise, you know, everybody's looking from different angles and you don't want to have to get everything right repeating it back to all the different people that you're working with for different purposes. The more you can get everybody into the same room, just hammer it out, it'll actually cost you a lot less even though you're thinking, oh, I'm paying all these professionals at once. You're going to pay them all, and then you're going to pay them to repeat it all to them so that they can get it right, too. So as you're going through, and especially on family transition things, and especially if there is a significant amount of debt on the land, you really need to have, like I say, a, a minimum of the, the bank or the lawyer and the CPA all, all there looking at the different angles together and hammering out. This is going to cause this problem for me. No, you can't do that. I won't do the lien release on the loan or whatever is going to come out of that. Again, we kind of talked about this on proactive planning since go through that, but the more you can think ahead, the more it'll pay off. Okay, so the American Taxpayer Relief Act passed January 1st, 2013. Did you read it? Huh? Did you read it? I, I did. Read. I told you I'm a nerd. That's what no. I did New Year's Day. Well, <laughs> nobody in Washington read it before the test. I was just wondering if y'all had Yeah. <laughs> That's Darcy. <laughs> like I was still sleeping. Anyway, it, it uh, passed January 1st. So, can we guess how much time and thought went into that? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. This is what it passed by. <laughs> we had the Senate by 89 to 8% or eight, and the House 257 to 167. So a lot of trading got done, and a lot of things got bypassed, and a lot of things got passed, and some good, some bad, some indifferent. But what this means to you, your 2013 filing season, or I guess for you guys would be filing your 2012. Well, you're filing right now. Yes. <laughs> We all have different languages. 
That means we're not going to start, the IRS is not accepting any of your tax returns until January 30th. It doesn't matter if you're a simple, easy, 1040 easy or nothing, they're not accepting it. So you can't do anything. Um, for other ones, it's going to be an even, even longer extended. Um, we've got, there's actually 30 different forms that they're not even accepted until they're saying the end of February to mid-March. But this does not mean that you don't bring your stuff in to us early. Because we want it early and we want it done. We will have it done and we will have it ready. But the biggest thing that's probably going to affect most of, uh, most of you producers is going to be the credits for the fuel tax and the depreciation, which is going to affect, you know, 100% of businesses in this country. They're not going to be able to file until March, maybe, possibly. Um, the good news is, those that were March 1st deadline filers, you get an extension. You get the April 15th like everybody else. Now you just have to check the box that says, and make sure it's your file in the 2210F, that says you are a farmer and you're exempt from penalties. Um, very, very important that that box gets checked or you're going to pay penalties because you did not pay throughout the year. And those are steep. Just one comment. I was in a conference call with one of Bacchus's aides this week. And because of the delay in the forms right now, there is no relief for calendar year end corporations and the partnerships and that, that, that also are affected. But they are in the process and it sounds like relief is going to come for those entities and that a lot of those entities would typically be due March 15th and they're not likely to be ready by then either. We'll probably have an announcement by next week, I think, on that. Okay. So part of the uh, part of the act, and I'm just going to call it the act. It should be go going through the Taxpayer Relief Act. I'm not going to say it. So the act, the income rates, everything went up slightly. The 10 percent, the 15 percent, the 25 percent, the 28 percent. The 33% and the 35%, they all kind of gradually went up to the brackets. What the major one is, is the new bracket that came across the 39.6% bracket for your higher income tax filers. So if you are filing single and you had income, taxable income over $250,000, you're going to be taxed at that 39.6%. If you're married filing joint, you're at $400,000. And fifty thousand. Here's the kicker. You're probably saying, "Well, I never make that much. I don't. It doesn't bother me." Ah, but if you're thinking about selling something, if you're land, if you're thinking about selling out, maybe you got a couple, you know, a couple big combines out there, or you had to sell off for the drought, but you don't expect to, but you're not planning on deferring it. You're going to be subject to that. Because if you just think about it, if you had to sell off your whole herd or if you had to sell off a chunk of land, what you'd get for that and what your taxable income would be. So as you're thinking about this kind of stuff, think about ways that we can minimize you being in that tax bracket. Um, and those brackets are here to stay. Um, I don't see them. Let me rephrase that. They're here to stay for as long as Congress wants them to stay. But I don't think they're going to take them away. So, Is a conservation easement viewed as a sale of land? It depends on specifically the situation. But most of the time, there would be a capital gain associated with a comp conservation easement. And so, yes, it would get included in your adjusted gross income for your taxable income for these purposes. And have you It depends on the situation, though. I didn't right. really and have you effectively completed a 1031 based on the proceeds from a conservation easement? Now, that depends on how you set up your 1031. You, you could have if you did it right. Yeah. When you get into those things, like I say, they're so specific and... I mean, we couldn't sit here and you just tell me I know. Right. You'd have to read the documents and make that determination because there's language in those documents that's unique to every situation. 
And I think that's a really good point because you often hear her say it depends or facts and circumstances. It means a lot because there's a way that we can adjust the facts to make them to what they need to be. But after the fact, we can't do anything. Um, if we only know a part of the p puzzle, we're not going to figure out the whole thing. So we're, it's not a cop out. It's not a we don't know. It's a it literally depends on what we what the documents say. Yeah. Um, That's part of getting all of those advisors in the same room before you do something major like that. But you can effectively work through it depending exactly. on the circumstances. Yeah. Yes. And having a good team is going to save you more money in the long run than it's going to cost you in the short run that you're going to have to pay their bills. It's very, very important to have that good team in place. Um, okay, back to the fun stuff. Capital gains and dividend rates. Um, in taxable income up to 72.5 of income, you're going to pay zero cap on your capital gains. Not zero income, just zero tax on your capital gains. Um, anywhere from your 7251 to your seven or to your 450, you're going to be in that 15% bracket. Um, new with the act is the 20% bracket for any of your um, income over that 450. They really like the 450,000 this year. I just so. want to make one point. When you t look at the capital gains, they take that first and then add all of your other income on top of it for the purposes of determining what bracket you're in, like for that 39.6, if you sell something. The capital gains go first, and then they add that on top on this, the 39.6. This does not include the investment tax that was in Obamacare, correct? It, that yep. comes later. That comes later. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> all right, AMT patch. It was made permanent. Um, this was a good thing. Um, had this not passed, there would have been, they were estimating over 60 million taxpayers subject to AMT tax. So the fact that they increased those exclusion amounts to the seven, 78,550 for married filing jointly and 80,000 in 2013 is a good thing because it was going to be down here to 45,000 um, and I, like I said they were estimating it would be about 60 million taxpayers that would be subject to AMT. Um, not a good number. Um, in, a, in addition to the patch they also allowed the non-refundable personal credits to offset AMT um, which had previously been disallowed so your credits you got to use them. Are we done? I don't know. I keep looking at a lot of people like staring at me in the door here. <laughs> what time are we supposed to be done? Case that at at four fifty, but I think people are listening. Yep. <laughs> okay. I, I, I well, we're fine as long yeah. as you guys are. But sorry yeah. that we. <laughs> She's long winded. Um. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, the atomized deductions. There's they're bringing back that phase out. Um. So basically, if you are over their AGI limit of marrying filing jointly of 300000 they're going to start phasing out your itemized deductions, 3%. They'll never go below 80% of them, but they're going to start phasing them out again. This went away in 2010 with one of the acts. Now they brought it back in, 2000, um, in 2012. Um, what it is going to exclude, though, is the medical expenses after, after floor is met. So these are not going to get phased out no matter how much they are. It's your medical expenses, your investment interest, your casualty theft, and your wagering losses. Um, those are all excluded from that phase out. Again, they're going to bring in the phase out of the personal exemptions. Um, so it's going to start out at the 350000 if you have API over that, they're going to start reducing that 2% over um, the 2500 dollars of the phase out limit. Some of the general provisions that came along with the act, um, they did lift some of the restrictions for the Roth conversions, the sales tax deductions, which woohoo, for you guys, not so great for us. Um, 
is still, they're going to keep that on there as a deduction. The child tax credit is staying. The earned, earned income credit is staying. Other child credits are staying. You can't shake your head at the earned income credit. Because then we're going to get stuck on that and we're going to have to talk about I it. I didn't say a word. <laughs> just, I just can't have that shaking. No, I didn't say anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, and the education incentives, all of those, they tweaked them, um, they're staying. If you're in that position where you can t benefit from them, please look at them. It's way too in-depth to start going over those all right now. Okay, so the fun stuff. What actually happened and what deductions changed? The section 179, they left it, or they kept it up the limits of the 500000 on the equipment and the livestock. Um, as long as you don't invest over two million dollars. So you're good for the next two years. Um, Darcy basically hit on why we do it and where we do it, but basically for your livestock and equipment. Now your bonus depreciation for 2012 and 13, we've, we've got it still, which is um, original use on active, uh, active participants and also rental, so you, that's the nice benefit of the bonus appreciation. Um, some of the other things, the research credit extended, I don't know how much of that it gets used. We don't see it a lot in our area, but a little. Um, and then the work opportunity tax credit was extended. So this is a credit that's available to employers that employ a certain target of employees. Um, one of the big ones is veterans. Um, you hire a veteran, you can get up to 6,000 uh, um, in a credit. Now, you have to do some hoops to jump through, so don't just automatically say, hey, I went and hired a veteran. There are hoops to jump through, so please be aware of those. But there is a credit out there if you are gonna hire a veteran. In the bonus depreciation, is land considered an asset? Land is not depreciable, so okay. um, there's certain limited areas where you can amortize part of the land purchase, but again, you're getting into something that you're going to need to sit down right. okay. and get state for years. Thing. <coughs> okay. um, part of the Farm Bill, they did extend it, uh, the 2008 Farm Bill, in its entirety to 2000, September 2013. Um, it includes the direct payments. The one, um, nobody is really getting a feel of what's going to happen in September, so I guess to be continued, but as of right now, we are on the 2008 farm bill. Um, okay. You can keep talking. Sorry, I'm talking. No, you just kind of, no, I'm good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, so what happens in 2013? The payroll holiday goes away. And for those of you that never heard of the payroll holiday, it was a reduction in the um, employee portion of Medicare, of no, Social Security, sorry, of Social Security by 2%. It used to be the 6.2%, they reduced it to 4.2%. Um, it's over. So as you're getting your paychecks, you're going to notice there a little bit smaller this year. Um, basically what that means for you is um, over each $10,000 that you make, you're going to see about a $200 less, which doesn't seem like a lot until... And that's on gross, it. right? Pardon? That's on gross, yes. not net. Yes. That's before deductions. Yes. Um, and then the, the net investment income surtax. Uh, we'll go over that in just a second. Um, the additional Medicare tax, your medical expenses, the floor increased to 10%, it used to be 5 point, or 7.5. It's getting there. And your health FSA maximum went to 200 or 2,500. Okay, so I think I talked about most of that. That includes on that um, payroll holiday, that includes your self-employment. So in 2013, 
you're going to be paying an extra 2%. You're okay this filing season right now, but next year when you go to file your 2013, that's going to be an extra 2% 2, 2 higher. The net investment income surtax. 3.8% on the net investment income. This is put in place by Obamacare. And basically what it says, if you make over the 250000 of investment income, you're going to pay an extra tax on that of 3.8%. Now this is a really sticky area because what do they conclude or what do they consider net investment income? Because at the one point in time, this was all interest, dividends, capital gains, annuities, royalties, rents, income from trade or business. They did add this from passive activities. But this is where your corporate structure comes into play. Are you considered a passive member or are you considered an active member? Um, if they go to sell that corporation or that partnership um, or the business or the assets out of that, Depending on what you have been, if you're a passive member or an active member, depends on if you're going to be subject to this. If you are passive, you are going to be subject to this tax if you reach the threshold of 250000 So that means your income over that 250000 that net investment income, is going to be an extra 3.8% tax. So a sole proprietor selling a conservation easement, does that apply? No, because you are an active member. Okay. You are you are the sole proprietor. You you don't have an option not to be um, passive. So you're okay as long I, as I'm going to go back to it. Really depends on how that conservation easement structure though. There's a chance it could it really conservation easements are very unique each time how they're taxed and treated. <laughs> Sorry, but I just don't want you to get too excited. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so here is where the study of the facts become very important. Um, going back those three years and looking at your history of how you've been treating stuff, etc. This is very important that all of this comes into play so we can determine if you're subject to the three and a half percent. Um, and with that, I'm going to say they're not even sure what to do with this yet. Um, they have a lot of guidance out there. They have a lot of you got to follow this and you got to follow that and you got to follow this. But there's no court cases, obviously, except for the court cases that the Obamacare is legal. Um, there's nothing out there to give us any kind of precedence of exactly what they mean and the interpretations of it. So be careful when it comes to it. All right, the additional Medicare tax. There is a 0.9 additional Medicare tax on all wages excess of the 250000 This is going to include your SE income. So if you have a good year, you're going to pay more in taxes. Um, right now, you're at 1.45. It's going to go up to the 2.35%. So that's coming, that is going to be in 2013. This is all to help pay for the health care bill. Just throw that in there. What's coming next? Are we safe from the fiscal cliff? We heard a lot about that in December and the, the months, I guess this month right now. The answer is no, we're not. Um, their fiscal cliff is... They fixed some things, they didn't fix some things, but the biggest thing is their debt ceiling. If they raise the debt ceiling, they can pay the bills and government goes further into debt. If they don't raise the debt ceiling, then they have a freeze, what do we call it? Freezing, spending freeze. It's already been raised though for three months, isn't it? Yeah, they have until the end of February to make a determination before sequestration kicks in. And what sequestration is, if they haven't made a determination either on what federal programs they're going to cut or what level they're going to raise the debt ceiling to, all federal spending freezes at that point, which means all federal agencies just quit getting their money. Right now, Congress yesterday passed 
the House representatives, and I don't know, I hadn't heard if it went through or not, they were going to pass another extension, another three months to May. That still has to get through the Senate, be conference, and then, so it's, they're kicking it down uh, from February on down to May. My best guess is that they're going to either continue to do extensions or delays um, for some period of time before they truly do anything because they just don't work that fast. Um, it's, it's crazy. I mean, they go around, every bill that comes up, they're all back in the back office saying, hey, if we put this in, can we get your vote? Hey, how about if we take this out? Can we get your vote? And they run around and do that for months before they ever vote on anything. It would be nice if when they put something in, they had to sign their name to it, yeah. like the 3.8%. Well, my personal opinion is they should never vote on anything that's more than a page <coughs> long, because you can't sit there and read a page before you say yes or no, but again, nobody asked me. So. <laughs> it's that deep. Yeah. yeah. If they had three minutes to vote for this, yeah. from the yeah. time it was presented to them, they had three minutes before the vote took place. But, like I say, I've been um, talking with some of the different aides for the Montana delegation, and they've been running around tallying votes on every issue for months. They had a price take on every item in there so that they could trade things out and know what the cost was going to be at the drop of a hat. This is a lot to talk about, guys. <laughs> Class, um, dinner table, <laughs> room. So. Really, this is this is part of that Obamacare. Um, like I, you hit it right on the head there. It's this leap. Um, there's a lot of things that are going. There's the health exchange program, premiums, assistance credit, excise tax, penalties, free choice vouchers. In 2018, the excise tax on high cost employer provided insurance plans. What that all means is, it's not yet determined. I mean, as far as they say, there's a lot of stuff in those bills. They have a lot of ideas, but they have to find a way to implement this. And if they're looking to the IRS to help them to implement this, they're figuring that the IRS budget has already went up a third just to implement the third 3.8% plus the 0.9% um, plus all the changes now. So we've increased the expending by a third to get who knows what, I'm, I'm a pessimist. They I'm passed sorry. it, and even the comments <laughs> themselves, they said, we passed it, we'll, now we'll see what's in it. And so now it's here, and it. we're going to see what's in it. Yeah. I mean, even as big a nerd as I am, I tried to read it. I read part of the health care reform. I just looked for the tax points, because I couldn't get through all of that stuff. Okay. And Feel free to write down our contact information and we'd be happy if you guys want to contact us with any additional questions. We're happy to visit with you. Then, easy questions, we'll just answer them for you. If it gets to anything that's more in depth or time consuming, we'll get your information because we will have to bill you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can pay the taxes on it. Just saying. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>